and cool. And Melanie, Hi guys. Melanie, um, go ahead, take it away. <laughs> perfect. Thank you, Steve. Hi guys, my name is Melanie, and I'm the observatory manager for the club. Our our uh, boy, our president is a little under the weather, and the vice president has got the headphones on right now. I can make him do the meeting, but you know he's he's got other things that he's looking at right now too. So <laughs> I will kind of lead into our um our, our guest guest speaker here. This is a, a place that I was telling you guys about. It's um Jane, you want you know more about it than I do. Do you want to tell them about it? Because I'm I'm super stoked. Because all Jack did was hand me his phone and say, here, copy down her phone number. Uh, well, it's a sort of accelerator for space-related companies' efforts. Um, I know they have a place here in Albuquerque and a kind of a joint workspace. But also the whole idea is just to encourage space-related companies, businesses of all kinds in New Mexico. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, that that sounds really cool. So I'm thinking, you know, because Jack and Teresa seem to be thinking that um that my our kids at school would would enjoy and, and enjoy working with them. So I thought that's kind of an interesting um an interesting thing. So yep. I will stop my share right now. And um we do have um a a bit of a a board thing that we need to kind of kind of mention to everybody. We are uh, our treasurer Roger has, has asked to kind of step back a little bit. His mundane, other than astronomy life, has gotten a little bit wonky, and so he's kind of we're kind of looking for um, for another treasurer right now. He's going to help the, the person finish up the you know the year because elections are in December. So if anyone is interested, um, please please you know speak up and say hello and. Um, you know, I mean, not not this minute, but you know, send us an email, send Roger an email, send send uh, Lori an email, saying, "Hey, I'm crazy. I, I have, you know, I'd like to be able to, you know, to play my play around with stuff and see what's going on." Hey, um, hey, Kevin, come on in. Come on in, Well, a few minutes because we started on time. Started at seven thirty. Sorry. Okay. okay. Um. Sweet. Okay. Cool. Now, this past weekend was this past week was Alcon. The Astronomical League convention. We went and did a whole bunch of cool, fun things. Um, Steve, you want to give them a, a Reader's Digest version of it? Next year it's in Baton Rouge, which is my hometown, basically. So I will definitely be there again. So you want to tell them all the fun things? Oh yes, Alcon 2022. It finally happened. We've been in the planning phases for three years to finally get this conference off the ground. We ended up with about 200 participants, a whole bunch of really good speakers. Uh, some really great workshops, a lot of other activities, uh, meetings out at uh, GNTO, the, the ATAS Observatory, had a star party at uh, Valle de Oro, which, hey, we got to see Vega. That was good. <laughs> there were other field trips to the VLA and so forth. So, uh, and boy, it turned out really well. Uh, whew, boy, was it a lot of work though, but well worthwhile and so next year baton rouge and melanie is already working away with that group so good for you melanie yes. um incidentally we the planning committee from alcon uh has tons of information that we are certainly willing to share uh and make the baton rouge event really successful so yeah because um, reinventing the wheel is no fun um yeah, I'll, I'll I'll put you guys in contact with the two guys that are that are hooking up everything in Baton Rouge. Uh, we also had a field trip out here. We had I think yes, it was about right. 20, 25 people come out here during the day because it, this is an unusual facility with it being, you know, part city, part us, and it's kind of kind of an interesting thing. And then in Baton Rouge is where since where I came from, the observatory at Highland Road Park is the city, the club, and LSU. So that's you know an, an even bit an even bigger conglomeration of stuff, and and after working with that one, it was like no university is going to be involved in this observatory because <laughs> it it's a pain. You know, it's like who pays for this? Who pays for that? I don't know. It's your building. No, it's not. It's your building. No, it's on your land. No, it's <laughs> so it's it's yeah. It gets to be a little um a little insane. So I picked up some silent auction things there, so you guys can can come and take a look at it after the meeting, whenever we get done. One other thing that we found at uh, Alcon was this neat little place down in the Gila. It's called SQM 22. 
And one of the co-owners kind of person, he and his brother kind of work together and have these amazingly dark skies. And his name is Tom. Oh, God. Uh, is pronounce your last name, Tom? Pestek. Oh, okay. I, I, got it. I was going to say, but I thought, let me not mess it up for him. But he's going to tell us a little bit about what they have down in the Gila. And it's it's kind of a cool, a cool situation down there. So, Tom, you want to take it away for a little bit? And you're muted, Tom. Uh oh, <laughs> you're muted. Oh, unmute yourself, Tom. Unmute. <laughs> there you I'm go. Back. Now you're back. Maybe the new okay. Word, the new Sorry. phrase in the next Sorry. last three years is unmute yourself. You're muted. <laughs> okay. Well, first of all, Melanie, thank you for inviting me to this meeting. Um, we, uh, my brothers and I, we own a little place called SQM22. And anybody that's a serious astronomer knows that's a darn good reading on the sky quality meter. Uh, Bob Fugate came down. He's one of my brothers is friends with Bob Fugate. He came down, wanted to take some pictures, whipped out his sky quality meter and he pulled it out. He looked at it. He jiggled it a little bit. He said, something's wrong. So he went back inside, changed the battery came back outside jiggled it some more and he said something's wrong oh wait i'm actually getting a 22 on a sky sky quality meter he said do you have any idea what you guys have here and my brothers and i are not astronomers so we knew we had dark skies but didn't know how dark so dark. that inspired us to get together and we have uh, it's it's about a hundred acre tract of private land inside the Gila National Forest, uh, where it's seven thousand four hundred feet elevation. Um, unbelievably dark skies. Of course, not this time of year. We have, end up with a lot of clouds during the monsoon season, which I'm sure all of you have had to deal with that. Um, but it's a we have three houses on the property, and we decided to rent out one of them. And it's a four bedroom, four bath house with everything in it except food. So we will rent the place out. Um, Melanie talked about possibly putting a group together and coming down. Uh, be happy to arrange that for you guys. Uh, oh, cool. uh, other than super dark sky, now I have to admit, we are new at this. We're not astronomers. We're learning, but we don't know. And we have a pad, but we don't have a, a what do you call the shaft? No, uh, a pier. A pier. pier yeah. Or a platform. So uh, at this point, until we get rolling better, you'd have to bring your own equipment. Well, let me back up. We do have a small four inch, oh, uh, I'm drawing a blank. Um, do you remember Melanie? Mark was telling you about it. Is it a reflector? No. It's a Schmidt. Cassegrain? Oh, Schmidt Cassegrain. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> little four inch Schmidt Cassegrain. Four inch. It's great for looking at the moon. And if, if you look hard, you can see the rings around Saturn. We were there the other night. But you certainly couldn't look into other galaxies or probably not even into the nebulas. Anyway, that's all we have now. We hope to upgrade in the not too distant future. Um, and we're also open to suggestions that you folks might have. We picked up a lot of tips from all the participants at the Alcon conference. We we'll probably learned more about what we need and don't need from people just stopping by and, and talking with us. And as a result of that, I've gotten several hits on our website. Oh, great. We're hoping, it, we're hoping it takes off. Um, uh, and one of the problems we're having, we're calling it a bed and telescope. First, they want to do a bed and breakfast, but nobody lives nearby. I, I live 50 miles away in truth or consequences. And I'm not going to drive up 50 miles to cook everybody breakfast. So you just have an open, a big kitchen where you bring your own food, you know, you do your own thing. 
and we ran it by the week. The reason we picked a week was if, if you're planning on a particular celestial event, who knows, you know, it's not always crystal clear skies. Occasionally we have some clouds and you may wanna work around that. You may need the whole week. You may need more, you may need less. Um, what else can I tell you about it? Uh, I'm, I'm sure most of you know Bob Fugate. Oh yeah. You know of him? <clears throat> yep. Bob, I wish I had the ability to get on your screen, but. It's uh, right here. <laughs> I have the paper right here on the table. <laughs> okay. Well, you could show them on the back side. Um, he took a picture from his backyard. You know, he lives way out on the Northeast Heights with, uh, with the same equipment. He was taking a image of Sharpless 2-240. And in the Albuquerque suburbs, it took him two nights, a total of three hours of exposure. He came down to our place with, with the SQM-22 and got in 40 minutes of exposure, got um, show that slide. Uh-oh, freeze frame. Melanie, can you show that? Um, yeah, it's right here, guys. I'll pass it around. It's amazing. The two the two photographs of the exact same celestial body uh, with a three hour exposure versus a forty minute exposure, and the the forty minute was. Oh my gosh. I'll pass it around. Yeah, there's an other back door. Yeah, they, the people don't want to come. Kiss lock. Can you unlock it, please? Uh, we have people that don't want to walk in front of the. The crowd in here okay. coming in. Well, Melanie, I'll just wait till you have an opportunity to put that slide up. I, I'm not. I don't have it on a slide. I'm just passing it around to everybody. I have the paper that you guys gave us in from Alcon. <clears throat> oh, okay, so you're not going to be able to share it on the screen. So no, it's on. It's in paper <laughs> form. I didn't make a slide from it. Okay. And stuff. Well, you'll have to take my word for it. It's incredible difference <clears throat> between the two photographs. And uh, yeah, it's crazy. Bob has taken some other incredible, done some incredible work up there at our place. He's the one that said, and I don't want to quote him verbatim, but he said he's been to many places throughout the world. And the only other skies he has found that were comparable to ours were down at that, um, oh, it's in Chile in the Andes. Oh, the, What's the name Ad, of it? The Atacama, Atacama yeah. Desert. Yeah, he said that was the only place that was thought was equal or even better than ours. So that's the quality of sky we have. Oh, wonderful. So we're we're hoping this will catch on. Um, we've had some guests before. We thought we hit the big uh, time. Can you turn the um the thing up just a little bit because the the speaker up a little bit. Let me do it. Oh, you're gonna do it? Okay. I got it. Okay, cool. And, um, and Tom, I think we're going to put your a link to your website on our page too. On you know that way, if somebody comes to our page, they, they can see that that you guys are are here. Since you guys are so new, the the more exposure, the better. I think. Well, uh, I'm anybody... sorry, Tom Thomas. What is the website? It. I was just going to give you that. Oh, it's <laughs> pretty simple. Sqm22.com. Wow. And it'll give you much more detail than I can give you in a five minute presentation. There's a lot of besides the dark skies and a wonderful place to stay. There's a, a lot of activities not too far away that you can participate in. Who's the white Subaru? I'm sorry. Uh, there was a question. There was the other thing. Does anybody have a question for, for Tom other than what Rick was asking on, online? Don't all ask at once. <laughs> Anybody have a question? Where's the nearest grocery store to, to that site? Oh, good question. Good, good question. Um, most people that are coming from the east, like down Interstate 25, 
they would stop in Truth or Consequences. There's a huge Walmart with a grocery store there. Okay. Uh, that's really the last place to get a good selection. But in the town of Winston, which is about 15 miles away, there's a little mom and pop uh, general store that has some food, you know, milk and eggs and bread. Not, not a big selection, but if you ran out of stuff, you wouldn't starve to death. Okay, good. We, we don't want to have like the Donner Party thing all over again. <laughs> yeah. I have to tell you, we had we thought we hit the big time. We had a group from the Paris astronomy, I don't, from Paris, France. There was a group coming right at the end of May. What was that asteroid or whatever that was flying over? Oh, yeah. That, that had it broken into four pieces. There was a group, they were coming down to, to watch it, photograph it. Hmm. And because it was coming over New Mexico, they picked our place to stay. And we thought, wow, we've hit the big time. All the way from Paris, they're coming. And then when that the black fire broke out, oh. the skies were just full of smoke. Now we, we were not affected. It it ended several miles away from our place, but for the whole month, nothing but cloudy skies. You couldn't even see the barely see the sun. Yeah. So we missed out on a great opportunity there. Oh, that's, that's too bad. bad. Well, well. There'll be some somebody else come along. Yeah, the people that came for Alcon were like, this is the desert. It doesn't get cloudy in the desert. <laughs> like, there's a thing called monsoon season. They're like, deserts have monsoons. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So and what's the time for them? My 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 brother and I were up there just last week. And a couple of nights were great, and a couple of nights were just terribly cloudy, could could barely see the moon. Anyway, um, if there's no questions, I don't want to take up all your meeting time. But cool, cool. Yeah, again, Melanie and all of you, thank you for inviting me. And Melanie, uh, get hold of me if you want to put a group together. We'll, I'll work with you. We'll do something. We'll be calling. Stick around and listen to Jane because she's going to be talking about all her all the cool things on Venus. If you'd like, that's totally fine. I will stick around, but you Go better ahead. put me on mute or I'll keep talking. <laughs> okay. uh, Kevin, did you have a question? Uh, well, apparently the black fire didn't get that close to this place, yeah. but the skies are as black as they can be. Yeah, that's what he was saying that it was the black fire was closed, but it wasn't. Uh, wasn't it helped a little bit? But, oh my and, gosh! And, yeah, and just so you know, the black fire has been out for almost a month. So there's the only residual effect we're having now is when the rains come. Those mountainsides that were stripped bare. Nothing but yucky black water runs down through the streams, and that probably will do that for another month. But just, again, it didn't get that close. To, it was a few miles away from our place. Okay. All righty, cool. Well, um, we got a few things coming up, a few housekeeping things. Uh, I sent an email out to the members this, this afternoon. We have Mayor Sunday's Fun Day coming up on August the 21st. If you guys can come, it's a ton of fun. The mayor rides a, a mechanical bull. It's hysterical, but it's also hot. And so it'd be nice to have a couple of people there that we can kind of trade off and, and go get out of the sunshine for a little while. We have an information table and a, ta and, and a couple of telescopes set up and, uh, and, and they don't charge us because we're a 501c3. So they give us a, give us a table and telescopes and stuff. And we end up getting a few things from silent auctions at, at that point too. The person that owns the, or that manages the premier cinema goes, you want tickets again this time for your silent auction? Yes, please. And so people are starting to know that we're there. We've got that coming up. And then uh, in October on the 29th uh, is our fundraiser. And we've got Larry Crumpler, who is actually Jane Arbell's husband. So they, they met, you know, and they're living out here in New Mexico in the geologic in the geologic, geologic wonderland. And they both work at the Museum of Natural History. And Larry just put together a book uh, about all his time on Mars. So he's gonna, we're gonna have that here for sale for, for those of you that want it. But tonight we get the other half of that couple. And Jane Arbell has spent um, quite a few, quite a few, miles on on venus as well i sent everybody mars this morning and i thought okay that's i'm not doing well you know having 14 things in the air at one time is not well i'm not not handling this well 
but Jane has spent a great deal of time on Venus and, and she's going to talk about what, what they have done in the past and what's coming up, which is some things I don't know. So I'm super excited. Awesome. So I'm going to turn it over to Jane. I'm going to go ahead and mute this. And if you guys have a question, you know, we'll stop. I'll say, hang, hang on. And then I'm going to have you guys come close to the, to the, um, the computer because we don't have a microphone out and about. So that if you, but if you're online, you are good to roll for questions. All right. He looks remarkably well for being on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One of our club members said that you don't you don't look like you're suffering the effects of the heat at all. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna go ahead and mute over here. Okay, Jane, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. Um, I gave a talk about Venus to you folks about a year ago, um, sometime last year. And I talked then about my kind of personal journey as a Venus research scientist. Last year, I was actually invited to give a major presentation about all of the geology of Venus to my colleagues at the Geological Society of America meeting. So that got me to thinking about the, the larger picture of what we know about Venus and what we don't know. And so that's what I wanna talk about tonight. And the cool thing is that there are three new missions to Venus that have now been approved and are in the planning stages. So let's see. Okay, so everybody's kind of heard that Venus and Earth are twins. Um, Venus is sometimes described as Earth's sister planet. I like to refer to Venus as Earth's difficult sibling because it's got some challenges. Um, they're very similar, radius, gravity, density, position in the solar system, but they're very dissimilar too. Um, a year, of course, is shorter than an Earth year, but a day on Venus is actually longer than a year on Venus because Venus rotates so incredibly slowly. And not only that, but it rotates backwards as far as we would be concerned. So if you could stand on the surface, watch the sun, it would appear to rise in the west and set in the east. But I wouldn't recommend standing on Venus because it's very hot, 900 degrees Fahrenheit, um, and surface atmospheric pressure very high, 90 times the atmospheric pressure of Earth. The atmosphere is dominantly carbon dioxide, almost 97%, very thick cloud-covered atmosphere. Um, for a long time during the space age, the surface features of Venus, which is one of our two closest planet neighbors in space, were totally unknown. For planetary geologists, of which I am one, we have kind of um, a sequence that most spacefaring nations have developed for how you explore a, a planet in our solar system. You start with Earth-based observations, either optical telescope or other kinds of telescope. Then the first mission you send to a planet or to another body in the solar system is usually a flyby mission. The spacecraft goes whizzing past and takes as many images and as much data as it can, sends it back to Earth. After that comes an orbiter. You send a spacecraft that's dedicated to going into orbit around a body or planet, sending back um, 
data that sort of is acquired over a long period of time with continuous observation. After that, frequently a probe or probes either to go through the atmosphere to measure it in some way or to go directly to the surface and impact it sometimes and send back some information. And then come landers. Now, landers have the capability of taking a bunch more instruments and sending back a lot more data. But the issue is with landers is we geologists always want to go to someplace interesting that's geologically interesting, which usually means it might be kind of dangerous. The engineers, on the other hand, say, doesn't matter how interesting it is if the lander crashes when it tries to land. So you're kind of stuck with a lander, usually in kind of a dull, boring, flat, featureless place, because those are usually the safest. So the solution to that is rover or rovers. That way you can land in a dull, boring place that's safe and send a rover off to explore something more interesting. Or in some cases, such as Larry will talk about for Perseverance, the comes right in a letter. Then you kind of repeat one through five over and over and over again with new and improved technology and instruments. And you coalesce all of this information into some kind of interpretation or analysis, usually through geologic mapping. The ultimate result from many planets will be hopefully a planned human mission in the future, but not for all bodies. So Venus could practically serve as a poster child for that whole sequence. It was actually the planet that had the very first planetary flyby ever. In 1962, the NASA Mariner 2 mission um, flew by Venus. And that's when we first discovered the high temperature and the fact that there was no measurable magnetic field. It took about a decade later before the first dedicated mission was sent, 1978's Pioneer Venus. And Pioneer Venus was a combination orbiter and probes, atmospheric probes. So you can see the probes here in this artist's depiction. They uh, gave us a picture of Venus's atmosphere. And you can see the results shown here. So this is the height of the atmosphere, basically, down to the surface. This is temperature increasing from left to right. And this is pressure increasing down. So if you draw a temperature profile of what the probes found in the atmosphere, it follows this line. You're um, in space basically until you hit the sulfuric acid cloud deck. And from that point on, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and higher and higher pressure. Notice right here, kind of in the middle of the clouds though, you're at earth normal temperatures and pressures. And that's an important thing to think about for possible human missions. The other thing we discovered looking at this temperature profile and looking at Venus's atmosphere was that the, the effect of a dominantly carbon dioxide atmosphere on incoming solar radiation and heat. And in fact, the term greenhouse effect was first 
coined at this point for the returns from Pioneer Venus and then brought back to, brought home to Earth once we understood the possibilities of a lot of carbon dioxide. In addition to the um, information about the atmosphere, Pioneer Venus was an orbiter mission as well. And the orbiter didn't have the capability of sending back radar images, but it did have a radar altimetry instrument, which gave us information about topography. So this is the, the sort of compilation of the topography data the dark blues are um, low areas, greens are intermediate, reds and yellows are extremely high. So you can see that on a first order look, Venus kind of looks like Earth with low areas, not covered by an ocean, however, and a few high standing regions, but mm, doesn't look exactly like Earth either. Um, at the same time as we were getting this topography data back from Venus, the Arecibo Radio Telescope in Puerto Rico started a long-term program examining, observing Venus using radar and producing radar images. Now, there was a bit of a problem though, because the best time to take the data was closest approach between Venus and Earth. But because of orbital resonances, whenever closest approach occurred, it always was showing the same face of Venus toward Earth. So we got lots of years of images that kept getting better and better resolution of one particular region on Venus, this highland area called Ishtar Terra. And this was one of the radar images taken. And radar images are a little weird. Um, they look like photographs, but they aren't. So you have to be careful and it takes time to learn how to interpret them, especially geologically. But dark, radar dark areas can be flat or low or low ref reflectivity. Radar bright areas can be high or high reflectivity. Um, or rough. And so in this case, we're seeing a plateau here that appears to be high but smooth and ringed with mountains, very high, rough terrain. This is also a good time to remind you that except for the first three features ever named on Venus, which happened to be Alpha Regio, Beta Regio, and Maxwell. Um, except for those three, every other feature on Venus is named for a woman, either real or mythological, from all of Earth's cultures. So you're probably familiar with Freya, Scandinavian goddess, Akna, was a Mayan goddess and Lakshmi and Ishtar um, Eastern. Um, and I just have to say, and I think I told you guys this, this, this last year, um, Larry and I had adopted two kittens just at the same time we were working on some of these images. And so of course we named them Akna and Freya. Okay, so what's the next step after orbiter and probe? That's lander. 
And the former Soviet Union was really ahead of the game, starting in 1961 and all the way to 1984, they actually sent a series of Flanders to Venus, the Vendiera and Vega Flanders. And um, they were incredibly successful. These things lasted each for about an hour on the surface, which was really good, um, and sent back compositional <laughs> data uh, of the surface and um, images. Um, this is one of the images here, and the color turned out to be due to the atmosphere looking through the carbon dioxide atmosphere. So if you were to pick that surface up, bring it to Earth, it would look like this. And indeed, the chemical analysis showed a volcanic, dominantly basaltic terrain. This is an, a picture, a photograph I took of one of the vineyard landers. It's a cutaway here. You can see the lander in the interior, and it was and totally encased in this kind of big, heavy steel diving bell type thing to try and protect it. Um, I took this photo in the Cosmos Museum in Moscow, and during this time period, both Larry and I were working at Brown University and Geology Research Group, and we had a cooperative agreement with Russian planetary scientists, spent quite a lot of time um, in several years working with Russian scientists, analyzing this data and other data, and preparing for uh, the next NASA mission to Venus. Now, in addition to the Vignetta and Vega landers, the Vignetta project also sent some orbiters, and these had the capability of images. So you're looking at some of the earliest, best um, radar images of Venus. The Vignetta 1516 image, the whole northern 25% of the planet from 30 degrees north to the pole, and this is our old friend Ishtar Terra again. You can see the flat plain and the mountains. And now with a little bit more resolution, you can see that these mountains look like what we on Earth might call a folded mountain belt, ridges, folds, something that seems to indicate being collided or pushed together a little bit, maybe. Um, also, there's a volcanic caldera here that you can see. Now, this image data set was at about one to two kilometers per pixel. But it helped us prepare for the next, uh, next mission, which was the NASA Magellan mission. And this was a, a simple, cheap, but flag, flagship type mission. Uh, it was simple in that it was only a single instrument, just this big radar dish and an associated altimeter radar to do um, elevations. Um, and it, it was the first of only two planetary missions ever launched from the shuttle uh, bay, the space shuttle. It was also constructed with spare parts. That big antenna was actually a spare from the Voyager missions. So Magellan was launched, went into orbit immediately and polar orbit around Venus. And the plan was that it would go up one side of Venus, take a radar image strip, turn when it got to the top, um, and as it came down the other side, 
send that radar strip back to Earth directly, turn again and keep going strip by strip by strip. It used momentum wheels for the position for this. And they were so incredibly effective that we put together mapping strips that were 20 kilometers wide um, to basically image ultimately almost the entire planet. And this is what it looked like. The Magellan mission lasted for about five years. Um, and once all the image strips were put together, we had 98% of the planet at 75 meters per pixel. That's, that means that something, a geologic feature the size of a football field could be resolved three, three or four pixels. Now, the mission was long enough that as the spacecraft orbited and the planet slowly rotated beneath it, we were able to change the orientation of the spacecraft to get both left look radar and right look radar, which gave us the capability of getting stereo in places. And at the end of the mission, we experimented with dipping the spacecraft into the atmosphere to slow it down and circularize the orbit. What that did was give us the capability of getting detailed gravity measurements. This error breaking experiment was the first of its kind. And we'll come across that later because some of the new planned missions are going to be using that. So in detail, what did we see? Okay, so this is um, this color-coded altimetry now using the Magellan data. You can see how much sharper it is. And here's our old friend Ishtar Terra up here again. But this is what the actual Magellan radar images looked like at that 75 meters per pixel. And we can now say that this is definitely a mountain with folds and faults in it. And it's very high. In fact, it's the highest um, mountain, highest peak on Venus at about 35,000 feet. That gives us an indication that there is some kind of structural geology going on, what geologists call tectonics, mountain forming. Nearby, there's another really Earth-like feature, and that's actually a rift that you can see here in a close-up image here. It's 9,000 feet deep. It's very similar to the Rio Grande Rift. And it's an area on Venus that's thinning and pulling apart. So again, we have indications of an Earth-like tectonic planet with movement on the surface and structural stuff going on. We also discovered a whole bunch of volcanoes. Um, and this was something that Larry and I primarily worked with. Large volcanoes, lots of them on the surface of Venus, bigger than 100 kilometers in diameter, and mostly big broad, what we call shield volcanoes, like the volcanoes forming the Hawaiian Islands. We've, you can see a central crater here with radial lava flows coming away from it. We also discovered lava channels, very similar to the rills on the moon, and what looked like lava domes. These were called pancake domes 
Um, but I always thought they looked kind of more like English muffins. Um, and then there were lots of small volcanoes. We estimate maybe a million of them. And those of you who watched my presentation last year know that that's kind of my field of interest and what I focused on for my own research. But very similar to the volcanic fields we see around the Southwest. So one of Flurry's and my jobs uh, for, for the Magellan mission was to look at each one of those radar strips as they came in, identify and classify every volcanic or magmatic feature we saw. And this is the map we ultimately wound up with, over 1,800 volcanoes, larger than 20 kilometers, so this doesn't include the small volcano so I was talking about. These are only the bigger stuff. So again, we have a picture of Venus as Earth-like, lots of volcanism, lots of structure going on. But there are some differences. Um, there were a whole bunch of features that we had never seen before and that were named by either the Russians previously or the Magellan team. Um, one of them was Corona. These bits are features that weren't impact craters. They seemed to be volcanic but they also seem to be related to some kind of structural feature to um, these big starbursts, like things that we assumed were radial volcanic dike systems. And these sort of features, the Russians called them arachnoids because they looked like spiders and spider webs. So this was kind of stuff that we had never seen before and it was definitely not Earth-like. But remember that Venus has no erosion, it has no surface erosion. So everything that affects the surface is still kind of depicted on the surface somewhere. And we think that these are surface features related to subsurface volcanic intrusion is something we don't see on Earth because they get eroded away right away. Okay, other weird stuff. Uh, some of the highland areas didn't look like mountains. They looked weird and they were called tessera uh, by the Russians after the Greek word for tile. Just all kinds of messed up stuff looking like the surface had was, was a series of small units and had been compressed in lots of different directions. In general, we feel that this tessera terrain represents older terrain on Venus, but we're not sure. And one of the reasons we're not sure is because of weird impact craters on Venus. Now, you're probably all familiar with looking at impact craters on the moon, but impact craters on Venus look very different. Part of it is, of course, the radar image. The ejecta shows up as rough, very bright, but part of it is Venus itself. The atmosphere seems to have a lot of effect. So we get this weird sort of low-baked, flow-like ejecta patterns. We get sometimes dark halos that we think represent shock waves in the atmosphere. We get multiple impacts all kind of landing together as though the object broke up coming through the atmosphere but stayed together. Um, but the main problem is a lack of very small impact craters. 
nothing like we see on the moon or Mercury. Um, nothing smaller than a kilometer in diameter and a lack of very big impact craters. In fact, Mead Crater here, named after anthropologist Margaret Mead, is the largest impact crater on Venus. And as you can see, it's only a couple of hundred kilometers in diameter. So there's strangeness here in the impact craters. There's another strangeness too, and that's the distribution. Planetary geologists, we like to use impact craters as kind of uh, um, a, an indicator of how old or young a planetary surface is. So, you know, you talk about the cratered highlands on the moon. They have way more impact craters than the Mare, for example, and the Maria. And that's because um, you're talking about resurfacing at different times. It's like driving down a street with lots of potholes. Then you turn a corner and you're on a street that's perfectly clear, no potholes. Which one was paved more recently? Yeah. Same thing with planetary surfaces, usually. Lots of impact craters usually means an old surface. But on Venus, there was a totally random distribution of impact craters. So no areas that had many more than others, we could get no relative age information. Not only that, there were only about 900 to 1,000 impact craters on the entire planet which is about the same number as on Earth. And we know that Earth, in general, the surface is relatively young on average because it's been wiped away by erosion, resurfaced by impact crater, uh, not impact cratering, but plate tectonics or volcanism. So, we started to wonder if the same thing had occurred on Venus. Now, I want to do a little side thing here just to tell you a little bit about what happens to all of this data. Um, because remember in my list of how you explore a planet, after you've got everything, all the information, then you have to coalesce it. One of the ways is by geologic mapping. And the US Geological Survey runs this whole um, program for planetary geologic mapping. The planets are divided into regions, sections called quadrangles. Scientists are um, proposed to map certain ones. And if they're fortunate, are given permission to do that. Venus was divided into 62 quadrangles. Now, I don't know if any of you have done much hiking or climbing and used Earth quadrangles. I mean, in general, it takes like hundreds to thousands of quadrangles just to cover the state of New Mexico. Here we've got a whole planet the size of Earth, and we've divided it up into 62 quads. Now, that means that each quadrangle is um, almost the size of the continental US. So that's a lot of territory to understand, coalesce, and map. I was fortunate enough to be um, part of this effort and my quadrangles are V11, Shimti Tessera, and V12, Vlama Planitia. This is V12, Vlama Planitia. As I said, eh, about three-fourths the size of the continental US. And as I was mapping it and coalescing data, I was able to define a new unit. 
called the Shield Plains. And subsequent to that, all of these maps have been analyzed, put together by other researchers who are starting to define geologic periods on Venus. Now you may know that on Earth, all of geologic time from 4.55 billion years ago to today is divided into what are called periods. And those periods are things like the Jurassic period, which everybody's heard of. Um, on Venus, we're just starting that process. And each period represents sort of a different assemblage of environment and geological evolution and formation. So, so far on Venus, we've got four, um, but it's just a start. And here they are, the pre-Fortunian, Fortunian, Guinevirian, and Atlian. Um, and my unit here, Acruva Shield Plains, has been slotted into about the middle of geologic time on Phoenix. So that's one of the ways that all of this information has coalesced. But back to the main story, um, as we discussed, we've got now evidence of lots of volcanism. We've got evidence of some mountain building, uplift, maybe folding, maybe, and evidence of a young surface because of the low number of impact craters. But there's really no evidence of what we consider Earth-style plate tectonics. And there's no magnetic field for Venus. So, and we know it has a very slow rotation. So we assume that there is no internal dynamo that would drive convection in the subsurface. That is what drives plate tectonics on Earth. So it's a problem. What the heck is going on with Venus? Well, after the Magellan mission, the proposal was made that perhaps Venus does this every 500 to 700 million years resurfacing, but we still don't know if it happens piecemeal regionally, if it's the entire planet kind of catastrophically suddenly overturns, um, or if there's some other kind of tectonic process. And scientists have been struggling with this for the last many years um, of, of no new data, basically. These are some of the ideas that have been proposed. Maybe it's just all driven by these giant plumes, magma plumes that come up from the core and mantle and uplift the surface and kind of break it slightly, move it around. Maybe the surface has, you know, kind of broken up already and it just kind of jostles around together like a bunch of ice blocks. Um, or maybe it's in an early stage uh, that hasn't developed earth style plate tectonics yet, where there's kind of like a single rind, a lid holding everything down. Um, until finally it just, you know, convulsively overturns every so often. These were all ideas, but we didn't have any evidence for them, really. And why is this important anyway? Because again, a general rule of thumb for geologists, for planetary geologists, is that the size of what we call a terrestrial or rocky solid surface planet appears to be directly correlated to the length of time 
that that planet is geologically active. So for example, Mercury, very small, we believe any internal heat, any internal volcanism shut down very early. Same with the moon. Mars, a little bit bigger. We think the volcanism continued there for a little bit longer period of time. Earth, very active, still active today. Venus, same size as Earth. So what about Venus? And the point is not necessarily understanding Venus, it's understanding Earth. We're in a situation where we only know one planet, basically. Um, and, and if you only knew one other human being, you wouldn't know if their characteristics were unique to them or if they were kind of similar to human beings in general. And we're in the same boat with planet, Earth-sized planets, is how unique is Earth? Or is Earth moving along a sort of geological evolutionary trend that other planets its size experience? So Venus turns out to be an important planet to look at. So it, it was so important, uh, actually, for example, that after the Magellan mission, um, other spacefaring countries were able to send missions to Venus. The first was Venus Express. The European Space Agency sent Venus Express, which was an um, orbiter, um, and it operated from 2006 to 2014. And it was primarily keyed to studying Venus's atmosphere, but it discovered something pretty weird. And that was that it, it saw in the atmosphere a big leak in abundance of sulfur dioxide that then tailed off. When scientists went back to look at the very early Pioneer Venus data, they actually saw the same thing. So, why is this important? Well, one of the ideas is that how you get suddenly a massive amount of sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere is a volcanic eruption. And so this might indicate that there was active volcanism going on during these two missions. Um, in addition, Venus Express had an imaging spectrometer that looked in both the visible and infrared um, and saw heat associated, heat signature associated with one of the large volcanoes on Venus. Again, not total proof, but maybe an indication. Following that, the Japanese space agency, JAXA, sent a mission to Venus, a Katsuki, and they launched in 2010. It missed going into orbit, so I had to do a few flybys, and finally went into orbit about 2015, uh, and is still in operation. And again, it was designed to really just study the atmosphere. But one of the things it had on it was a lightning and air glow camera. And it never saw anything for five years. But in 2020, it actually caught what's called a transient optical flash. And that is interpreted to be lightning in the atmosphere. Now, the Venus atmosphere is very dense, very thick, very sluggish, doesn't really have storms, doesn't have wind. Um, it's more like being in the, at the bottom of the ocean 
as far as activity. So one of the ideas is that the lightning might also indicate volcanic eruption. I don't know if you've ever seen videos of big volcanoes erupting on Earth, but frequently there's lightning associated with them with during the eruptions because the, the fine ash particles become ionized and kind of produce the lightning. So here we have not proof, but an indication that maybe Venus is a lot more currently active than we ever really could prove. So that brings us to a couple of exciting things. And that is that NASA has always had what's called the Venus Exploration Analysis Group or VEXAG. And this group has met over the years to define key areas of Venus, key questions that really need to be solved and approached by future missions. So two exciting things. One, VEXAG is going to be held here in Albuquerque at the museum in November. Um, and two, NASA and the European Space Agency have all approved So there are three missions that you can expect to hear about. One is a NASA mission called Veritas. And uh, they were, you know, NASA, NASA loves acronyms. So Veritas, of course, means truth, but it's also an acronym for Venus Emissivity Radio Science Insar Topography Spectrometry. <clears throat> and it is tentatively planned to launch in 2028. It's a geology and geophysics mission, which really makes me pleased. Um, enough with the atmosphere. Let's look at the planet. And this is, again, a simple single instrument uh, mission that is going to use INSAR, interferometric synthetic aperture radar, to generate maps of the surface. Oops. This allows us to see the surface geology and to look at some of the internal geophysics. What we'll be looking for is active volcanism and tectonism, any changes since Magellan and Venus Express. And the mission will um, be able to produce some 3D global maps of the surface and using that arrow breaking technique to eventually cir circularize the orbit uh, to measure the gravitational fields with newer instruments than we had um, for Magellan. So the key point about Veritas is um, that Magellan showed a planet with deformation on the surface. And there has to be some internal processes driving this. So what are they? How Earth-like actually is Venus? It's gonna focus on that weird tessera terrain um, to try and find out what its structure and rock composition is. It's asking the question, are the plateaus, those high areas actually like Earth's continents or are they something different? Is Venus still volcanologically active? And is there water in the subsurface? The second NASA mission 
planned for Venus, there are two, is called Da Vinci Plus. Um, and I really had to stretch for this acronym. It stands for Deep Atmosphere Venus Investigation of Noble Gases, Chemistry, Imaging. And plus means that there are also cameras to map surface rock type. So again, this is a complicated mission. It's scheduled for 2029 to 2030, but I wouldn't be surprised if it gets delayed a few years. It includes um, a flyby orbiter, starts out as a flyby, does a few, two or three flybys, and then orbits the planet, um, and a probe. And it mostly is looking at the atmosphere, but it's got some other stuff going on too. So the flyby orbiter will analyze Venus's atmosphere, de hopefully determine if Venus ever had an ocean. Um, it will track motions of clouds, map, hopefully map surface composition. And after a couple of years, it will actually release a descent probe that will first use a parachute and then kind of slowly glide down through the thick atmosphere for about a one hour descent to, to again reproduce the Piner Venus probes, but with new technology to sample atmospheric chemistry, temperature, pressure, and winds. What's interesting about that probe is that it will descend right over Alpha Regio, right here. Here's our friend Ishtar Jera. Here's Alpha Regio. And Alpha Regio is a piece of tessera. So the idea is to have the probe settle down and take surface composition and high resolution images of this tessera terrain as it gets closer and closer. Now they're hoping for 20 minutes on the surface uh, of life, but even if it shuts off when it gets to the surface, most of the data is planned to be taken on its way down and as it approaches Alpha Regio. And then it's got a bunch of instruments um, on the flyby orbiter, lots of spectrometers, on the probe, lots of cameras and imagers, um, and a spectrometer. So lots of stuff, lots of data that will be coming back from Da Vinci. The European Space Agency has taken a slightly different approach they're again, a big single instrument orbiter. Um, and their whole point is to try and understand why Venus and Earth evolved differently. Uh, notice the, the English spelling here in some of their points. Um, so they'll be looking basically at the entire planet from core, as they put it, to outer atmosphere. And again, we'll use um, aerobraking to um, circularize the orbit to enable them to see the gravity field better. They also have a sounder um, that will reveal any underground layering down to a kilometer. So the questions that they want to address are things like how have the surface and interior evolved? How geologically active was and is Venus? Um, have the atmosphere, have geologic processes shaped the atmosphere or has the atmosphere shaped geological processes? Did Venus have oceans? How did Venus lose heat? And when did that greenhouse effect get started? And they actually have 
what sounds like more than one instrument, but it's all kind of wrapped together into a single radar instrument with associated spectrometers. So those are the three upcoming missions. And this Envision mission from ESA is scheduled for the early 2030s. So hopefully starting in about 2029 at the end of this decade, we'll start having lots of new data finally coming back from Venus. And <clears throat> maybe we can answer some of the fundamental questions about Venus and therefore about Earth as a planet. Now, remember that list where I talked about ultimately headed toward human missions. We are certainly headed that way from Mars and Larry will talk about that uh, in October. But uh, for Venus, remember that temperature pressure profile in the atmosphere, that place in the cloud deck that's Earth normal temperatures and pressures. There have been several um, possibilities raised about maybe having a long-term observation structure platform um, that would just kind of hover at that level in Venus's atmosphere. Astronauts could certainly travel there um, and operate it and perhaps it as a staging to operate other remote mechanisms and rovers and explorers on the surface. So that's the story about Venus and keep your head in the clouds. So any questions? Um, yeah, we've, we've got some questions. Um, do you want to come on closer? If you have a question, come closer or ask it, and then I'll kind of relay it to Jane, because the farther you get away from here, um, the more you've got. And I see one, Andrew Cooper has a question too, but Roger's got a question right here. Let me pass around. Uh, Jane, you were talking about the shield volcanoes, um, like the Hawaiian volcanoes. Do you guys know what if that's from a basaltic-like? lava or does the high pressure would, would it kind of press and flatten out like volcanoes that's a really good question and that actually has been explored uh, because we are talking about a kind of uh, regime um, like uh, as i said at the bottom of earth's oceans so there is some pressure effect in that even if you were um, had a more explosive eruption, a more silica-rich eruption, uh, it would tamp it down a little bit. You wouldn't expect to get such high peaks developed. But um, indications are that the volcanism that we're looking at on Venus and on actually most other planets what we've looked at so far, like Mercury and Mars and the moon, um, are, is basaltic. So we're assuming that, and the indications from the Vignetta landers um, sent back composition that indicated basaltic. So we're assuming most of the volcanism on Venus is basaltic. But I mean, if we were to find some silica-rich volcanism there, that would be really phenomenal because the only reason we get silica-rich volcanism on Earth is because of plate tectonics, which actually alters the composition of rock um, and has produced the silica-rich crust of Earth. So that would be a really great indicator of that Venus has some kind of similar 
tectonic regime going on, even if it doesn't look exactly like Earth. But that's a great question. A okay. couple questions here. Uh, one on our chat, Connie Flores is asking, does the equator have more or less evidence of surface stresses than the poles, or just about the same spread around the planet's surface? Yeah, that's a good question too. There does not seem to be much difference as far as we can tell now, because the planet rotates so very slowly around its own axis. So, um, so far I would say no, but again, we, we don't really know all that much about Venus to tell you the truth, even though we've been looking at it for uh, 50 years now since the first flyby. Um, we don't see evidence of more surface stress in geologic features around the equator. And I have a question. Um, okay. Obviously, you've discovered that Venus does not have a magnetic field. We know that the lack of magnetic field on Mars has caused the solar wind to strip away the atmosphere. Has there been a similar effect on Venus's atmosphere? That's a good question too. And a lot of researchers today are doing a lot of work on whether Venus may have had an earlier atmosphere that might have been stripped away and was then replaced by this uh, dominantly carbon dioxide, very thick atmosphere due to volcanic outgassing. Um, we, again, it's, it's a great question. And there's all kinds of good questions for Venus. <laughs> and we know very little about it um, yet so far. We know, we know some stuff. But those sorts of things we would hope to be able to answer, especially with the two atmosphere missions that are coming up. Um, a lot of people are interested in that, whether Venus had another type of atmosphere, whether Venus had liquid water on the surface at one point before the runaway greenhouse effect took place all of those issues and maybe some of them we can solve through some of these missions with some data, but probably not all of them. Thank you. What else? Hi, Jane. I have a question about the a geologic timeline that you showed for Venus. Yeah. So without the usual crater counting method, how did y'all determine the relative ages of the different units? Great question. Um, mostly it's by relative stratigraphy. So all of those individual quadrangle maps, when you map, when you define a unit, you can you look for indicators as to whether an adjacent unit is overlapping it or it's overlapping the adjacent unit. And so you can build up kind of a, a relative stratigraphy that way um, within individual regions. And what the folks who were are trying to put together this first geologic timeline have been doing is coalescing all of these and taking these kind of small regional stratigraphies and trying to, to find a way that puts them all together into some kind of reasonable order. One of the things that's coming out of that is that it does look like the tessera, that really weird surface terrain is old and might represent the same type of terrain as the lunar highlands, but it's so old and it's been so deformed that you've literally lost all of the impact craters on it. So yeah, impact craters, unfortunately, great tools 
for dating services and stratigraphy on other planets can't use them on Venus. So we're really, to be really, really accurate and to make a real understanding of the geological evolution of Venus, we're going to have to land, collect a sample and get it returned so that we can actually date it because so far the technology does not exist to do this um, very rigorous dating techniques uh, in situ. We have to bring a sample back to the lab on Earth. And that's one of the reasons why Perseverance is collecting samples as part of its um, mission on Mars is to ultimately return those samples to Earth so that we can finally get some kind of a real date that can be a marker bed for everything else. Any plans for a sample return mission to Venus? <laughs> well, people have talked about it. In, in fact, I was involved in a really early proposal uh, back in the early 90s, mid 90s, I think. But the, there's lots of technology problems. And one of them is the, the temperature. Um, actually, Glenn Research Center in Cleveland has done a lot of work on trying to develop high temperature electronics that could operate under the temperatures on the Venus surface. But that's the whole problem with any kind of rover or automated thing of any kind, you use electronics. Now, the ideas about using mechanics instead of electronics, and there was one thing that kind of was going to set down on the surface and use springs to kind of hop around the planet and maybe it could collect samples that way. I'm um, used to got the problem of how you get it off the planet, but that's another issue. Um, also, there have been ideas about oh, kind of um, like, uh, you know, sails that could be uh, put on craft that could move around the planet that way. There's a little bit of atmospheric circulation that could work for that. But the, the temperature is a bigger issue than the pressure then? It's 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 the temperature primarily for electronics um, because we we can send you know diving bells and submarines and, and um, you know the the very specifically designed subs down to the mostly the ocean depths but it's the temperature that's the issue. Thank you. You guys have great questions. Here's a question I have like before. Venus had oceans and a different type of atmosphere. I wonder if it was ha habitable for life. Never know. <laughs> and we may, we may know at some point if we return rock samples that have some indication, um, but uh, yeah, you know, it's interesting. All of the early science fiction authors always, they knew about the cloud cover. So they always depicted Venus as, you know, kind of almost like a, a Mesozoic swamp, you know, with lots of, of water and stagnant jungle type vegetation and, and life on it. Um, and, Unfortunately, that was did not turn out to be the case, but maybe it was in the past. There are a lot of people, a lot of Venus researchers who are firmly convinced that Venus did have water and oceans early in its history, um, but that, that all went away. Another one. Um, Venus, of course, has an extraordinarily slow rotation rate. 
Um, any indication as to why? Was there perhaps a giant impact earlier on in history that caused Venus to slow down? That's usually what people suggest, um, that dynamics are such that that could have stopped Venus from rotating actually in the direction that almost all the other planets in the solar system rotate and then kind of started it back up again, very slowly rotating the opposite direction. Again, that's a good question and we don't really know. There are a lot of um, solar system dynamic hypotheses that have that that have bodies from the outer solar system coming in and you know crashing into Venus or even in some cases have Venus um, having formed farther away and moving uh, closer to the sun as it crashes into some other body but these are all sort of you know just mathematical theoretical things that could work but yeah again we don't know hey jane uh thank you for uh doing the talk this evening i've got a question about the elevations that you gave for objects on venus is that measured from the base of the object or to the lowest point or how do you get those numbers the, that's a great question. Everybody always asks, how do we get elevations on other planets? Because there's no sea level, right? We use mean planetary radius on Mars and on Venus and on other bodies. So that is 36,000 feet above and 9,000 feet below mean planetary radius. So that's what about 40,000, 45,000 feet at total difference. On Earth, the total difference between the highest point and the lowest point, the uh, you know, Himalayas and the Marianas Trench are almost as more than double that. So there is there are extremes of topography on Venus, but they are, it seems like it's all been kind of smoothed over, so to speak. So there's not quite such extremes and highs and lows, but it is pretty cool. There are pretty tall mountains. Thanks. Any other questions? We've got another question. Kevin's going to make his way up to the machine. Yeah, I have. I'll just stand here. Yeah, just lock the cord, Kevin, if you come around. Uh, has a uh, has carbon carbonatite volcanics uh, been confirmed with certainty? Uh, I mean, some of the lava flows look like they're carbonatites. Mm -hmm. The only planet we know of so far that has carbonate uh, eruptions is Earth. We have not found evidence for that on any other body. And, uh, you know, carbonate is, is pretty unusually, unusual chemically. So it may not be able to be generated on other planets. We don't well, know. The, yeah, the, the uh, presence of all the carbon dioxide might suggest carbonatites are really important on Venus, but uh, it all depends on uh, the uh, source and the volume of the melt. Because if uh, you, know, you melt large parts of the uh, upper mantle or lower crust on Venus, you're going to get the basalts. But That's right. you know, I guess right. until we actually sample the surface, then we won't know. That's right. And most, you know, on Earth, most of the carbon is locked in to the carbon dioxide, even it's locked into limestone rock. Yeah, right. um, on Venus, of course, it's pretty much all in the atmosphere. So we, if, if there were earlier 
oceans and water and life on Venus, there might be some source of carbonatite that magma would come up through. But um, we, yeah, again, we don't know. But that's a really interesting question. I don't think anybody has ever calculated how much would be required on Venus to, you know, to produce some carbonatite. The, wow. um, the volcanic domes that I showed you a picture of were always kind of problematical because they looked so sort of frothy and they were a candidate early on for, well, maybe there is some silica rich volcanism on Venus, but we're thinking now that it's probably basaltic, frothy <laughs> volcanism, if that makes sense, <laughs> with lots of gas and training. Um, one last question. Um, the, uh, when you look at the density of Venus, uh, can you say for sure uh, how big uh, an iron Nickel iron core might be, and then uh, no, you don't. No, know? no, and I meant to say that when I showed that that sort of general cross section of the planet, that's totally just made up, assumed. We we have no idea really what the interior of Venus is like, how large the core is, how large the mantle is. And hopefully that's what um, particularly Veritas will help discover because um, it has the capability of, of some geophysical instruments that will look deep surface of the planet. And I, I guess uh, the thick atmosphere kind of prevents any uh, radiometric data coming from the surface, right? Radiometric data, you mean? Um, yeah, I mean, you can't get through the atmosphere to see what kind of radioactive stuff is there. Oh, yes, no, uh, yeah, yeah. The, the atmosphere has been a big problem all along. <laughs> uh, not only couldn't we see the surface, but um, the only thing that could get through the clouds is radar, basically. And so that presents an interesting problem. Um, you're looking, you're, you're purposely looking through clouds to try and image the surface. If there were an active volcanic eruption going on, like right now, just as you're looking, you probably never see it because the radar is designed to look through clouds. <laughs> so, so you would have to wait until later to see if there was any new lava flow or change on the surface to, to detect that. And that was one of the ideas that possibly Magellan lasting for five years would see some change uh, over the years in the surface, but we never did. Um, anyway, thanks so much. Maybe there'll be some change now that uh, um, Da Vinci will see and Veritas will see. Okay, well, thank you. Good talk. Thank you. Any others? I think you basically tapped out all the questions in the room. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Does everybody Good. give me? Round of applause from over here. Very fun. Thank you. Thank yes. you. And, and thank you, Tom, for popping in from way down south or mediumly down south to tell us about a cool opportunity too, as well, because that's, you know, it's always exciting to have another place to go. Definitely. To stay and, and so enjoy. Guy. Let me do a commercial for October. Okay. Um, is this, the speaker around or is the cat? Really? <laughs> I'm not sure if he'll he'll come or not. He's in, he's looking at perseverance stuff, but um, 
Yes, there, I understand there's this top-notch Mars scientist who's just written a, an amazing book who is going to be your speaker for October. So be sure you don't miss that. Yes, 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 yes. I, I had flyers, but I gave them all out at, uh, at, the, at the, thing, yeah, the thing I did the other day. <laughs> so I'll, it's, on, it's on our website. It talks all about it, time, the date, and everything. Good. It'll be here, and um, we'll have family activities for a couple of hours and food and a silent auction. And then Larry's going to talk at about at around 7 o'clock or so. As soon okay. as it gets dim enough outside to be able to see a projection on, on the building, because right. we'll have more than about 25 people there, I'm certain. So it'll be a projected right. on the building. And a book is designed for passionate amateurs, interested enthusiasts, older students, anybody who's interested in Mars. So yes. um, I've, I've had it pass briefly through my hands as they say, can we have your book? Because we sold out fine. You know, so, so now <laughs> this time we're going to have just a, a few more here. And Jim and I are going to get ours off the top. <laughs> All right. Yes. Yes, I yeah. know. Poor Jim. He keeps having to give up his too. Oh, yeah, I've bought three books so far and I've given them all away. So <laughs> one of these days I'm gonna keep one. Ask a question and has one already. And so I told him to bring it and he'll sign it for her. Yes. Larry will sign it to you guys. So you need to keep well, she just someone. <laughs> yes. 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 No, that'd but, be cool. Uh, We're gonna have probably about 15 of them or so to sell because I know Jim and I want two off the top so you know we got to make sure that we have those two there and uh get, so that you know get be cool. 20 because we can always make use of them too okay yeah all right we will and we found a place um I forget where it was oh it's Barnes and Noble actually that we can get them for actually less than Amazon is selling them so that'll be oh. a good thing right. excellent Good. You can also buy directly from the publisher HarperCollins website and okay. have a slight discount. I don't know how their price. Um, okay. I'll take a is. look and I'll, I'll use my mad librarian skills and see if I can pull in a, you know, a, a better discount since I'm, I'm buying it. You can even ship it to the school. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yes. Yeah, but, something. Okay. But also keep an eye out for these upcoming Venus missions because they will they will be an unknown territory to most people. But now you guys know what to look for and what to what to think about. Yes, I'm I'm looking forward to it. I think that's exciting. I didn't know a lot of these things and you know, it's, it's very cool to know that we haven't just kind of said, oh, well, we're on Mars now, we're good. We're gonna go play over here for a little while. But that's that's super cool to know. Uh, Steve, I think you can stop the recording. All righty, I shall do it. And here we go.